Yo, you want help with that? Oh, no, don't worry about it, man. All right, guys. I've got everything we need to survive in the wild. Check it. <laughs> okay, there's a McDonald's like four miles down the road. Yeah, what happened to uh, eating healthy? Guys, these goods are gluten-free. Yeah. Speaking of the goods, how are you and Jenny? Oh, guys, Jenny's like this chocolate bar. She's sweet, and she's best without the wrapper. <laughs> Attaboy. Oh, okay. So, have you guys, uh, you know. Gentlemen, I believe less is more. And when I say that, less clothes, more bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's love, you know? Really? Love? Uh, yeah, she loves my bod. <laughs> okay, well, outside the body, has she said, I love you yet? I told him I loved him. <laughs> it only took you, what, three weeks? These things take time. Three weeks? You sure don't waste any time jumping him. How else are you gonna know? Wait, what about you and Josh? Josh is not going to work. He's cute, his parents are loaded, but all Josh thinks about is sex. He just has no clue. I could never marry him. I'm gonna ask her to marry me. She's the one, hands down. Hands down what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, come on. Funny guys, but I'm serious. I'm vowing to never look at another girl if Betsy will promise to spend the rest of her life with me. Her hair, her eyes, the way she sips coffee, the sex, I gotta have it. Hey, could you give me some chocolate, please? So, Mikey, you and Megan, making any magic? Dude, Megan's hot, man. But not as hot as Betsy. Yeah, we're just taking it slow, you know? Kind of feeling things out. Ah, feeling, feeling things, things out. out. All right. <laughs> <laughs> You'll feel out. So, Mike wants to take me on a road trip. Nice. I like where this is going. It's just a road trip. Mm-hmm. There's a band we both like playing this weekend. It should be fun. So are you guys getting a hotel or staying with friends? Uh, no, I think it'll just be a day trip. Save money, you know? Megan, you get a night alone with your man? I'd be all over that. When was the first time you guys slept together? We haven't. Is she serious? Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. She's serious. When you say you haven't done it yet, like any of it? What is it, the end of the world? Parents, religion, STDs. Yeah, we're waiting, you know? They both think it's the right thing to do. Is there anything wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hey, you gonna eat that? Dude, how do you sleep at night? Alone. Yes, I am going to eat that. I call it the Betsy. Okay, dude. Is, is, is it marriage you're waiting for? Marriage? Yeah. We're waiting until marriage. Oh, I, well, that's cool, man. Yeah. Good for you. That's... Awesome. Super cool. Let's look at love. No, not sex, but love. 
To understand what it is, let's make sure we're clear on what it is not. Infatuation? This is not love. Oh, it feels like love, but it isn't. It's this intense, exciting, fireworks kind of feeling, sometimes thought of as a crush. It's like a hundred yard dash. This emotional burst of speed and sudden attraction to someone of the opposite sex is usually based on physical features. You are consumed with this person. You only see the good things about them. That's because you usually know little to nothing about them. And that makes it superficial. Infatuation is like a helium balloon. It rises fast, but cannot be sustained. Now let's look at desire. More appropriately, sexual desire is not love. Oh, this too feels like love, but not so much. It's this strong physical excitement that a person has for someone. It's a strong craving, lust, or longing for sex to be connected to them. You believe this person may be your soulmate, the answer to your loneliness, your hero. Sadly, many people have sex based on these feelings, but it too is not sustainable. Love? Wow. That's tough because, well, it's not about you. It's all about them. Love is a decision to care deeply for someone with genuine concern, wanting what is best for them without the expectation of anything in return. It's considerate and kind and doesn't demand or misuse the other person. So how do you know if you're in love or if the relationship you're in is true love? Time. It takes time to really get to know someone, to discern between infatuation and love, to embrace them for who they are, their good points and bad points. But in this day and age, when we are accustomed to immediate gratification, taking it slow is not usually what people want to hear. Love can embody passion, but even when passion fluctuates, true love will stand the test of time, faults, struggles, and challenges. Because love survives. Um, I gotta think about this. I'm not really sure. I believe that it all falls back on the individual's like sexual desires. Um, how long they've, they've been, been together. together. Because if it's for a short while and they're just right off the bat doing it all the time and I just think that's too far. I really think you should wait because people should want to feel used, you know, because they can get sex out of you and then just leave, you know? Well, I was raised with the idea that saving yourself until marriage is what you needed to do. And with my parents, that's what I was told to do. And I was scared to death to tell my parents that I hadn't waited. If you're missing that part of the relationship until you are on your wedding night, I don't know how you could know that that's the person you want to marry. You mess up your relationship in the long run, you know? Like you shared an intimate moment with this person and then you completely go off and do something else. You're like, you still have connection with that person. So I would have preferred her to wait, but <laughs> in my mind, but in the real world, I know that she wasn't going to wait. Waiting until you're married to have sex is a little unrealistic, personally. I mean, I highly recommend making sure you're compatible in that regard before you get married. As a teenager, definitely not. That can wait. I think that there is value in waiting to have sex until you're married. My husband and I both did that, and it was worth the wait. Um, it's something we will instill in our children someday. I don't think there is a value for waiting towards marriage because no one does it now. When there's not that commitment there, um, I see that as being a real problem. It was hard to wait for it, but we knew that it was going to be worth it in the end on the, when we did get married. Having uh, premarital relations, um, that can cause a lot of problems when diseases, unexpected baby. I was a young mom, and had I had the decision to opt out and wait and hold out, I would make that decision today. I believe there's no right or wrong. It's just totally up to you. If you feel like it's okay, then it's okay, and if you don't, then it's not. There's a real case to be made just in terms of all the single family homes, you know, all the kids growing up without fathers. 
once you do have sex, it's a completely different type of relationship. It's just not worth the risk to yourself, to the person you are having sex with, or the future child that could possibly happen. Dating relationships are exciting. You meet someone cute, and all of a sudden, the world looks different. Do you know, whether you're 16 or 96, there are eight stages to a relationship when it comes to dating and intimacy. For our kids, these are boundaries to help them navigate these new waters they're stepping in. It helps them and us know where they're at and where they're going. Stage one, talking and flirting. This is normal. This is how we break the ice with someone we're attracted to. But once we have their attention and we like each other, now what? Stage two, holding hands. Ah, this is nice. It's our first form of contact. Plus it tells others, hey, we're together. Stage three, hugging. We hug our mom and our crazy Aunt Ruth, right? Why not hug the person we're starting to date? It makes us feel warm, close. They're in our personal space, and we like it. But soon we want more. So what's next? Stage four, casual kiss. Wow, did our lips just touch? That felt nothing like the peck we get from crazy Aunt Ruth when she visits and pinches our cheek every Christmas. This? This sent a tingling sensation to our fingers and toes. And now, we want more. Stage five, lingering kiss. Now we're definitely on a slippery slope. We're kissing long enough to have to catch our breath. Oh, and those hugs, they're tighter too. It's no longer just our fingers and toes that tingle. It's our whole body. Everything in us is craving for another. It's natural but it's so dangerous because we're awakening something inside of us before its proper time. And yes, the electricity we feel, we don't want to just leave it there. Yep, we want more. Stage six, intimate touch with clothes on. Making out became boring and we could never go back to holding hands. But this, this feels right, but it's not. We're experiencing all sorts of emotions and physical changes that surely this must be love, but nothing could be farther from it. Now, pretty soon, all the physical contact to this point, it just doesn't cut it anymore. Stage seven, intimate touch with clothes off. We're in big trouble. We've become vulnerable and captive to someone else. Our body is a gift from God and we're letting someone else mess with it. Stage eight, sexual intercourse. Hooking up, jumping bones, doesn't matter what we call it. Unless there's a wedding ring on our finger, we've just connected ourselves to someone physically, chemically, emotionally, even spiritually, for the rest of our lives. Statistics are against us that this relationship will last, and we've just given up a precious gift we could give to our future spouse.
Hole in My Heart Ministries exists to help people who are struggling with sexual identity and addiction. We feel like Jesus has said, you need to build your house on the fault line and live there. This is volatile, but it is exactly where there are so many people who are in so much pain. It really began out of my own story. Um, I knew when I was wrestling with this and really looking for resources as a pastor's daughter who was struggling um, with same-sex attraction, I couldn't find anything. I just felt so other and so different. And so I knew even then, I was like, man, if I ever make it through, I hope we can find someone, a Christian who struggles with this, who can talk to me, who can help those who are wrestling like I did. So is it possible to be a Christian and struggle with same-sex attractions? I have to say yes, because I am a Christian and I still struggle with it, even as a married woman and soon a mom of two. I would go to church each Sunday and hear the sermon about idolatry and about giving God your whole heart, and I'd be screaming at the pastor silently, like, I know, I know, how do I become more Christian to get rid of this? And what really rescued me wasn't becoming more Christian, it was experiencing Jesus and seeing that he was able to walk alongside me in and through this struggle like he's able to walk alongside everyone in and through their own struggles. I remember at one point when I was really wrestling with this and I just remember writing in my journal, I wrote, it is harder for me to stay in the church than to leave it. It'd be way easier to leave. You know, I'd hear, you know, we're not allowed to say certain jokes, but gay jokes or gay adjectives like, oh, that's so whatever can still pass. And so I stayed and I'm glad I did, um, but it is much harder because you feel the sin difference that people have. You feel that sin scale. The biggest thing I would recommend for parents to do is before you even engage in the conversation with your children, start with your own heart. Like, how do I honestly feel about homosexuality? How do I feel about people who are you know, gay, lesbian, or whatever, do I see their sin struggles as differently than my own? If you know that you elevate sleeping with someone of the same gender, to be quite frank, as a greater sin than sleeping with someone of the opposite gender before you're married, take that to God too. Jesus, is this really, is this what you say, Lord? Is this, look at the word, read some good resources there. Sin is sin, sexual sin is sexual sin. Just like a struggle with you know, heterosexual lust or you know, getting wasted or drugs or pride or people pleasing. That struggle is not the sin. It's the act of the man lying with the man or the woman lying with the woman that is what God is not, not, it's not okay with him. That's why when people ask me, so what are you? Like, are you gay? Are you bisexual? I say, I'm a Christ follower and this is what I struggle with. This is why these conversations are so critical. And this is why checking our own hearts before we even engage in these conversations is so critical. And so I would, I would really encourage people, pastors, youth pastors, to really start talking about this because kids are probably wrestling with it here. And not in order to fix and change and say, you're gonna be better and Jesus is gonna free you. But really what you're hoping for is this nurture and this love and this experience with Jesus. Not more Jesus language, not more right and wrong, which is necessary and we need it. But experiencing the love of Jesus is actually going to satisfy what you're craving in your heart. So there's a lot of letters uh, and it seems like there are more being added. LGBTQIA, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, Q can be questioning or queer intersex is I and A is asexual. And so is there an agenda? Is there a gay agenda? Is there an LGBTQIA agenda? I'm sure there are some people who really do have an agenda, but I would really encourage, we are all humans with a heart that started in brokenness at some point. We all have this God-shaped hole in our hearts, even if we don't want to ever say that we do. So even someone who has this incredible agenda that we would see. They're like staunch, they're yelling at you, they're writing things. It began with a piece of their heart that was saying, I feel lost, I wanna be seen. Does anyone care about me? Where if we would in love as believers, as parents, as neighbors, as friends, come alongside them and be like, yes, I see you, I love you. Yes, I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not better than you. Like, let me hear about that story. That sounds like a real pain with that breakup or that trying to figure out who you are. And so, 
our job as parents, as friends, as youth workers, as everyone is seen beyond the, the agenda, whether it's there or not, it doesn't really matter. I'm always, as someone who is in this ministry, I'm always going to the heart. And it is not a focus on changing someone's letter or identity statement or sexuality. It's a heart change. Jesus didn't come to make us heterosexuals. Jesus came to make us disciples and his children keep the doors of communication open before they claim those letters or claim that as an identity statement so that their only identity statement is son or daughter of Jesus Christ. My name is Don Pearson. I'm a pastor to parents, and particularly parents of adolescents. So the phenomenon of social media has come about as kids started relating online, sharing and building certain parts of their life in the digital world. And that world actually began to take precedent over the real physical world perhaps 10 years ago and they could operate in that world from any context. All they had to do is get the right device and they were in. Literally, from a kid's perspective, it's fairly endless and they will go in and out of dozens to find their preferred hangout space. From Facebook to Twitter to Snapchat to Kik to all of the apps that began to be downloaded, parents experienced an overwhelming sense of the inability to keep pace with changing technology. One of the pitfalls we have as parents is we often identify a given technology platform as the pitfall, where really the issue is never the issue. And so we're always dealing with two things at the same time. We're dealing with the cyber security issue of a given technology, and we're dealing with the human heart. And to try to parent those in balance is our real challenge. So we'll see a young girl highly frustrated because she was trying to make things happen, set up parties, include certain people that she wanted included, more importantly, exclude certain people that she didn't want at the party. And she begins to use this technology platform as a manipulative device which further exposes her heart. But for a young girl, it's always a catch-22. If she can manipulate a guy into noticing her, did she really answer the question of her heart? Am I noticeable? Am I desirable? But trying to do so by manipulating social media to certain outcomes. Guys asking deep questions, do I have what it takes? But backing up, because in social media they can get all of their questions answered without having to take the risk to move towards a girl. I think parents uh, have a twofold uh, responsibility, not only to be aware of what kids are going through, but to actually manage it, to find programs or apps which actually allow them to dial back the usage of their kids, to report back to the parent how much time was invested in video games, how much time was spent on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, and Snapchat. So a parent has the dual role of managing and limiting technology, as well as uncovering what that technology is revealing about their kid's heart. The loneliness, the sense of isolation, the desire to be noticed and to be important, and all those things we've all grown up with but are expressed very differently now. So how do we bring balance into parenting when it comes to social media? First of all, we're responsible to filter out a lot of the junk that's coming in. So rather than do what we tried to do 15 years ago is filter 100% of the junk and keep it away, now what we're trying to do is have the type of software that filters but reports. Really up in the game of conversation, sometimes we have to go counterintuitive as parents and we have to expose our kids to things ahead of schedule where we would have never dreamed of talking uh, with a seven-year-old about uh, sexual issues 
Now we know that they're going to come up on the playground, they're going to slip through the filtering software that we have, and it's going to be a confusing time to them. And so we almost have to expose them to topics, bite-sized pieces of topics ahead of schedule, and let their experience base catch up a little bit. A lot of times, face-to-face -face conversation about technology choices is daunting and somewhat uh, threatening to kids. If we can learn to turn a little bit and go more shoulder to shoulder when we're in car rides, when we're walking, when we're watching a movie together, a lot of times conversation will come out better as we go shoulder to shoulder and even sometimes talking about another family, another situation that's outside of us where we're really talking about ourselves but without the heat. I'm Julie Smithy. I am a licensed clinical psychologist working with children and adolescents doing outpatient therapy and also doing testing and assessment work. Relationships are complicated. They're complicated for adults and they're especially complicated for teens. A lot of times you may look at a teen and think that you're talking to another adult. Physically, they look like adults, but it's important to remember that they're not adults because they're not fully developed. The prefrontal cortex is the last part of the brain to develop in people. We know that um, it's still developing through adolescence um, and into early adulthood. The prefrontal cortex is the source of judgment, seeing into the future, so planning, seeing how behavior can affect the future, abstract thinking and decision making, you can imagine that when you're talking about sexual relationships, teens aren't set up the same way adults are to handle those. When teens first meet someone of the opposite sex, uh, there's a flood of chemicals that bombard their brain and dopamine is secreted in the prefrontal cortex. It's secreted in response to excitement, pleasure, new things, adventure, risk taking. And dopamine causes a person to feel good by introducing intense energy, exhilaration, and focused attention. When two people come together physically, they're bonded together, but they're bonded more than just in a physical way. There's a biochemical basis for that bonding as well. Sexual intercourse releases large amounts of oxytocin in the female brain and vasopressin in the male brain. And both of those hormones promote bonding with a sexual partner. That's why you will always remember the people that you've been with before. You're creating a trust relationship with that person. And breaking those bonds um, are difficult. If you have a pattern of um, having sex and then breaking up and having sex and breaking up, it's more difficult to have a long-term relationship. That bonding and unbonding leaves a scar. Communication between teens and adults is, is vital. We need to know what our teens are doing. We need to ask them how they're feeling about things. It's hard because teens don't always want to talk about things like this with their parents especially, but as hard as it is for us as parents, 
Um, if we don't open those doors, our teens are out there on their own and they're listening to their friends, um, the media, other people who may not have their best interests in mind as we do. Everything about you makes no sense. You're not that pretty and your hair's a mess, but I like you. Yeah, I like you. So let's do one more review of what's going on in the adolescent brain. Though I may not say it, I need rules and boundaries because I'm always in hyperdrive and always moving. I know it makes you crazy, but it's my brain. I have a need for taking risks, feeling like I'm kind of the boss, but not without a safety net. Now, of course I need affection, acceptance, love, and lots of attention, lots of it, even when my door is shut. Also, what's happening in my brain is this fear of failure. And when I do fail, it's gonna be your fault because blaming others and focusing on self is also dominating my thought process. Oh, and selective hearing is probably going on more than you like. <laughs> Much more, I'm sure. And that's why I borrowed the car. You said I could. I don't remember anything about putting gas in it. And finally, my brain does want to please those who are important to me. That need is way, way up there. And so is my sensitivity to addiction to drugs, alcohol, and yes, sex. These are some of the things happening in the adolescent brain. What's not happening? Well, I don't understand the why behind don't do this or that. Self-control is not going to be my strong suit either. Also, if you think I'm reading your body language, social cues, or sarcasm to stop me from going to the mall, I'm not. That sound you hear is me taking the car again. Oops. Most importantly, my ability to stop what I'm doing in the heat of the moment and evaluate the long-term consequences, who wants to do that when the dopamine is flooding the prefrontal cortex? You heard what that does. I'm probably gonna mess up. That's why when it comes to focus and good judgment calls, I'm gonna need help. Again, I, I may not say it, but I'm gonna need you.